Welcome to the South Okanagan Make Water Work Pledge Challenge. My name is Zoe Kirk and I work in the Public Works Department at the Regional District and part of my job is water management, water stewardship and making water work in outdoor landscaping so that's with outreach and education. It's the RBC Blue Water Fund and they were very instrumental in us having this beautiful rain garden here, the low water garden on the other side of our building which are actually outdoor teaching classrooms. I'm going to introduce Anna Warwick Sears from the Okanagan Basin Water Board to say a few words about the Make Water Work campaign. I know that it is feels funny this year to be talking about water conservation uh, when we've had an incredibly difficult time with high waters throughout the valley. Please, we need help reminding people to not waste water, to only irrigate when they need it because our treatment plants are running at full capacity, there's too much sediment, we can't process this water fast enough and so now more than ever we still needed to have water conservation and the water conservation me message going out there. So everyone in the Okanagan needs to be reminded that it is very important to not waste the water. It's an extremely precious resource and even more precious when you spend so much money to clean it and treat it and raise it to the highest standard of water in the world. And what people are encouraged to do is to go online to makewaterwork.ca and make a pledge. It can be one thing, save water by watering between a, a dusk and dawn if you've got an automatic watering system or you can take all six of the pledges and then you're automatically entered to win a six thousand dollar low water makeover for your yard or your garden. Now if you're in an apartment building you can take the pledge because you can gift it to a charitable organization should you win. So that's a win-win because maybe a boys and girls club that doesn't have the ability to have that can then have it. So they have this wonderful easy online pledge and we encourage everyone to challenge one another and challenge the sectors that you're in to save water, go out and take the pledge. It's a community-based behavioral change. And when we come together, sometimes it's best to learn from our peers. Okay. Well, it seems kind of funny to invite someone like me, who ordinarily works in the Garden of Souls, perhaps, <laughs> to talk about literal gardening, but I'm afraid in my, in my home, in the regional district, some years ago, well, I bought a house in 1999, and wouldn't you know, about six months later, my septic system failed. I won't describe that at length, but when the folks came in with their bulldozers and other instruments of destruction, by the time, by the time they left, a finished garden had been completely destroyed. So the challenge for me was how to replace it, not only in an aesthetically pleasing way, but also in a water-wise way. So I engaged a designer who had become a friend of mine. Her name was Deborah Ritchie, and we set about redoing my property. In any case, that's a story unto itself, but here at the Presbyterian Church, of course, uh, we have our church proper look, that looks like something dropped out of the English countryside, and then we have a little house across the lane which serves as our office. And in front of that office was a typical yard. It had grass, our favorite water pig. It had a cedar hedge of very greedy plants. It had a diseased birch tree. So we decided that it needed replacement. And so similarly people said, well, why do we need to redo the annex garden? It's perfectly fine. Let's just water the grass a little bit more. Let's water the cedar hedge a little bit more. Yeah, we can replace the tree. Let's put another birch tree in there. So in any case, we decided on a radical makeover. So right away we pulled out our friendly patch of grass we replaced it with rock, and of course right away people say, well, rock? That is so ugly. Why would you take a stand of beautiful grass and replace it with rock? But of course the trick is to dig perennial gardens and incorporate other features into that situation, and suddenly you find something that 
is as aesthetically pleasing as anything you want to do from a gardening point of view. So here in our garden, we have a laburnum tree, which sits about the middle of the drought tolerance scale, but is certainly a vast improvement on our dying birch. We have a mixed little perennial bed here of echinacea and rubecchia, in other words, purple coneflower and uh, brown-eyed Susans, uh, both very, very drought tolerant. We have some calamagrostis, which you see to my left here, although ours is variegated. It's a step up from this plain green stuff. Uh, totally drought tolerant. Sorry for the rose. That's a carpet rose. I'm not sure how super tolerant that is. That's Campanula. That's reasonable on the drought tolerant scale. Then you see a giant stand of yarrow. Now, yarrow is super righteous on the drought tolerance scale. Behind here, we plucked out this evil cedar hedge, and these are actually cypress. Again, a certain degree of righteousness in terms of drought tolerance, and there's mugo pines growing underneath that one day will grow up to match the cedar hedge. And then behind here in this perennial garden, we have coreopsis, another righteous plant. We have lavender. We have shasta daisy. We've got all sorts of interesting, relatively drought tolerant stuff. Now, interestingly, even though when you plant a plant, of course, you've got to be careful to water it in super well, which doesn't seem that wise. I think a lot of gardeners make the mistake of putting a plant in and saying, well, I've got to be careful with my water. Let's just give it dribs and drabs. Well, the more you water in a plant in the beginning of its life, the deeper the roots go. And then as it lives out its life, ironically, it becomes water wise with rich and deep roots. So that's what we did. Not only that, we weren't afraid to be rather intense in terms of our, in terms of our perennial beds. They're straight out of an English garden, not like our church itself, not unlike our church itself. And once, of course, you have a lot of dense plantings, you put your irrigation system underneath, and so the water goes between dusk and dawn underneath the canopy, as it were, and so you don't have all this daytime evaporation of water. So, we're not claiming perfection on the righteousness scale, but we made an effort. Amen. And the irony is, is that it's aesthetically beautiful, frankly. So, um, water-wise gardening is possible, even for a church, which is normally concerned with other things. So I challenge all the churches and all the public service organizations to become water wise. Now, as I make that challenge, that challenge isn't necessarily always to those institutions because they have a lot of things on their plate. Many voluntary organizations, nonprofits these days don't have a whole lot of money to go around. But that doesn't mean to say that members of the public who care about this issue can't come and provide their help. It's very easy to lodge a complaint, isn't it? Those of you who work in government know that. You're the one doing the work. Everyone else is sitting on the outside lobbing stones. I personally don't have a whole lot of respect for that approach. If you're concerned about an issue, get involved. Don't just lob stones. Anyone can do that. And you can help nonprofit organizations. You can help the city. You can help the regional district. Don't just lodge complaints. Get involved. So, hey, that's my sermon for the day. Thank you. And just step to your right, Colin, because you get a gift. Oh, my. Yes, this, this is perfect for those that still have sprinklers. You just turn this upside down on your lawn, time it. When it gets full, that's the amount of water your lawn needs for the week. So, thank you, Colin. Thank you. Now, when he talks about impassioned resonances and people, there is nobody that I've met more passionate about water conservation than a transplanted Western Australian. So may I introduce to you Miriam Pender. Come on up and take the challenge. And I will hold up your stuff. Okay. Well, thank you, Zoe. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm originally from Western Australia where the rainfall where I grew up is the same as here, about 12 inches of rain. Is that correct for here? 13 to 16. Oh, you're flooding the place. <laughs> no, 
Where I grew up, it was only 12 inches. That was the average. And sadly, right now, they're having a drought. And so the children I grew up with, who are now the current farmers, it's a wheat and sheep farming community. And it is really challenging to use water there. So I have grown up with the fear of waste, wasting water. And when I first came to Canada, water. I arrive here in Canada and I've never seen so much water. We were living in Burnaby for decades. And when I first got here, I couldn't believe my mother-in-law's sink, my future mother-in-law. It looked like a commercial sink to me. It was so deep. It was deep. And then we went over to some friends' places and their sink was deep too. And I thought, wow, these Canadians. And I arrived in the September and it was rather dry that September. But then the rain came. And then I understood why Canadians were so cavalier with water. This is about the size of an Australian sink in Western Australia. That's the sink. So you don't put a lot of water in that. Now, if you look at your sinks right now and you were to get a, a, a tray like this, a pan like this and put it in and only use that to do your washing up at the sink, you'd save a lot of water. You wouldn't be doing this 675 litres of water a day. And what you do also this is going to be known as the West Bench Sink. <laughs> Miriam's from the West Bench. Yes. And this little bucket, it's an ice cream, old ice cream bucket. That's what I use to wash the fruit and veggies in. And when the fruit and veggies have been washed, this needs to go out and water a plant outside. It doesn't need to be poured down the sink. There you are, you're saving two to four litres of water each time. That's a lot of water. Now my mother, she is incredible with saving water. And she taught us that what you need to do is you need to have a bucket in the shower. What, a bucket in the shower? Yes, you have a bucket in the shower because you know when you turn the shower on, generally speaking, that water when it first comes out is not warm enough. It's either too cold or too hot. You need to catch that water. Now, if you want to use a bucket, fair enough and you can save up to four litres of water and that can go out in your garden. But if you've got a bucket like this, you start it and oh, you don't want to carry it, it's too heavy for you. If you've got one with wheels, you can put it up against it and then you can just push it with your foot and push it out of the way and finish your shower. And then you can take it out later on. And when you go to take it out, you don't want to just dump it in the garden. What you want to do is to be kind to those flowers, kind to those plants. You've chosen a bucket that's got a pouring spout on it. Pour that water into your, into your watering can and then you can spray it wherever you need it and you're giving the plants just the drink they need. You're not wasting water this way. You're repurposing it. So, how can we have a garden that's water wise? Now, you're not going to believe this, but it's all about... Oh my God, she brought the diapers. A diaper. Oh. It's all about a diaper. Now, this is just a child's diaper, you know, and this is, this is how much comes out of a child's diaper. So if you take this diaper and you pull it, you take this diaper, it's very easy to pull apart. I'm not going to shed it completely, but you open it up and then you take the filling out and this is perfectly friendly for, for your environment. But when you add water to it, and that's going to hold the water and release it into the dirt. So you take this water, you take this mixture. In fact, I've only put half the liquid in that it would take. So you would double that. Mix it with potting soil, put it all together, and then you put it in here. You put it in here, you put it in. I just filled it up and then I put the plants in here. You, the secret is to choose uh, plants that require the same quantity of water. So you don't want to mix and match. You want them with the same water needs. This way you're only going to have to water your plants every, every once in a while, not all the time. You just want to check to see. Sometimes it feels a little dry on the top. Don't be fooled. It's holding water inside. 
So that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I challenge you to reduce your water consumption. I'm happy to be here as a farmer and um, aware of, I want the other farmers to be aware of what the dangers of us not having water sometime because it's very important with the way things are changing in the world and with the climate, we don't know it might rain like this spring and it may not. So um, I challenge all my fellow farmers to use the amount of water they only need. I know it's very important to grow fruit as we all eat it and we need it, but my pledge is to make sure that all farmers use the little water they possibly can. I'm an architect in Penticton and um, we do a lot of different types of projects. This, this project for the regional district office, it used to be that the drive aisle went right around all four sides of the building. So you had a street on one side and then parking and drive aisles on the other three. Part of the complaints that we had from staff before we did the renovation project was that the south side of the building was too hot. There was too much reflection coming off of the pavement. So replacing that redundant drive aisle with a green space on the south side of the building creates something for staff to look at out the window um, it also creates shade. We've put a series of shade trees in there. Eventually they'll get big enough, they'll shade the entire building. So tremendous savings in air conditioning, um, but also a tremendous improvement in you know, what you have to look at while you're working all day and, and the environment on that side of the building. So we do houses, for instance, we have a house we just finished up above Penticton on the hillside. It's about a one acre lot. We've only disturbed about a tenth of the site area. And so that other 90%, it's ponderosa pines, it's bunch grass, it's sagebrush. Um, it doesn't require any watering, and it's a beautiful um, garden-like natural landscape. So my challenge would be to the development community, uh, particularly excavation contractors and the surveyors that are doing the initial subdivision. You know, look at how much footprint do you really need for the building you're putting in, and the remaining area, leave it natural. Uh, those plants don't require any watering, and the mature trees, the mature plants, uh, create a wonderful microclimate around your building. So just, just don't scrape it bare. Leave what's there. We are all, uh, well, I'm a foreigner, and we all come attached to our plants from our childhoods, and we have, I would like to pledge that we have to decide to use plants that are more suitable for this semi-arid climate. And I wanted to talk in addition to challenge that Corinne, where is Corinne here, that uh, Okanagan Basin Water developed, we've also developed a plant collection that with Okanagan's Airscape Association and Bylands Nursery. And these plants are um, chosen by several nurseries locally to carry them. So even if you don't want to do too much homework, you can just go directly into the section of various uh, nurseries and they're all listed on site and you can blindly collect those plants and, and it will do its job. They will not need that much water. And if you do have emotional attachment to certain plants, someone already talked about hydrozoning. You put those closer to your door and you water those a little bit more and then for the rest of the landscaping um, use the proven drought tolerant plants. And so Make Water Work is, is not just a website I think it's becoming more of a mantra or, or a way of life around the Okanagan here so um, and it's it's good to see the rain garden here and what we've done in Penticton and there's some color to it so there yeah. is there is some punch to it instead of just the dull gray that everyone t calls as zero scaping. There's, uh, there's, one, there's Penticton's. Uh, a little like more colorful than, than the, the regional district's one, but we're not comparing. <laughs> it's not a competition. Make Water Work, when we first launched it, we really were talking about water conservation, and we still are talking about water conservation, but we were talking more about droughts and the need to prepare for, for dry years. But really, when you look at the principles of Make Water Work and the, the tools and the tips that we're giving, they really do help us in wet years as well. And really, ultimately what it's about is preparing your landscape for those two extremes. We are going to see more flooding, we're going to see more droughts in the Okanagan. And so it's really our attempt to work with municipalities up and down the valley and with residents to prepare your landscape for both those extremes of the wet and dry years. Today we, we heard some very practical examples of how we can conserve water which 
if you sort of think about it, uh, makes sense, right? And just like running the tap while you wash, wash your teeth, now more and more people turn it off. And it's just changing that mindset it doesn't happen overnight, but I challenge everyone to to open your eyes and push your comfort zone in terms of water usage around your home, in and out. Uh, we've learned, I think, and I've learned that you can water, you can have some green in your yard, you can protect your trees. I mean, we had people that just shut off their water. We still have brown spots in our community. But when you think about it, everybody, if you don't have water meters, and you don't have to pay for your water over and above your taxation, you really overwater. And, and really right now, nobody in my community overwaters. Nobody has a sprinkler on all night. Nobody washes their driveways. Nobody has a leaky toilet because it can cost you $300 a month. Um, we've reclaimed a lot of water. All of our, our uh, best practice, for example, is all of our effluent we reuse. So we water a golf course, our cemetery, a couple of parks. The school district bought into buying reclaimed effluent. And I think of the millions and millions of litres of fresh water that's not being used on our golf course and now they're just be because we reuse it. So I pledge my uh, local politicians just to pursue best practices. Uh, we're not there yet, but we try. So with Make Water Work, there are a couple of things that we're trying to encourage. So people to, to use less water on their landscape, and they can do that by, you know, looking at, through the Make Water Work plant collection at makewaterwork.ca and find plants that are suitable. We've got garden centre partners up and down the valley that, that are working with us to make sure that residents have the right types of plants to put in their yards. But also by going to makewaterwork.ca and taking the pledge to Make Water Work, you're then entered to win a $6,000 WaterWise yard upgrade. We've done upgrades in Asuyus. We've, I don't know if we've had a Penticton winner yet. So this might be the year. Um, but we've had winners in Vernon and and, uh, and Peachland and Kelowna. So yeah, I think it's Penticton's turn this year. So they just have to, you just need to pledge and, and see what happens. Um, the other thing is that we award and make water work champion community each year. So the first year we did it was 2014 and Oliver won Make Water Work champion community then and then followed by Armstrong and then last year Peachland took it and RDOS and Penticton have declared their intent of taking the uh, the title this year so you can help your community by uh, saving water of course by taking the pledge and by doing so then increasing your chances of your community being named Make Water Work champion this year. Uh, but overall here, I'd like to challenge all of my colleagues, all of the directors at the board table, to get out there, get this information to your communities, encourage them to take the pledge. So now, do I have any other politicians that would like to challenge Mayor McCordoff? Please take the staff. Thank you. So I've already done my challenge online and what I'd like to do is challenge all the directors and anybody else in the area to take a three minute shower. Uh, Director Kozakovich didn't specify that but I think a three minute shower is quite doable. So I challenge you all to do that. Why do we use so much water? It's hot. And so we use water to, you know, to, to quench the thirst of our landscapes. Really, with Make Water Work, one of the things that we're trying to encourage is wise water use. So, yes, there might be the need for more water, but if we plant the right things and if we do it right on our landscapes, if we're not watering in the middle of the day, we're watering between dusk and dawn and adopting other principles through Make Water Work, then you'll actually be using less water. And the idea of, you know, making sure to plant the landscape that suits our valley. So look at the landscape around you. You don't expect to have a Vancouver kind of landscape in, in, in the Okanagan, right? Look at, at the hills, at how dry it is. There, you know, through our Make Water Work plant collection, you can find a variety of plants that, well, even here at the RDOS, you can see that they've planted beautiful um, plants in here that are you know, lovely to look at, but don't require the amount of water that, that uh, some other varieties would. So we've got a few months ahead of us where we're expecting record breaking and we are seeing record breaking temperatures. So there's gonna be evaporation off of our lake. We're gonna be seeing more people using water because of course they wanna keep their, their yards beautiful. Um, there's the farmers that need the water for their orchards and, and their vineyards and everything else. And of course there's gonna be the need for water for firefighting too.